Hello, everyone. I'm James Millat. Welcome to this very special episode of Talk of the Town. Uh, just even looking behind me, you can see that we don't have our usual Talk of the Town backdrop um, because this is a map of the world because we are have, uh, having a special interview today with one of our own here at ACMI. I think that uh, knowing this young woman, a lot of people past, present, and future would like to say that she's one of their own. Uh, but we here at ACMI can do so, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the conversation. Anyway, let me introduce her. She is Gayatri Sundarajan, who has uh, been here uh, in Arlington for a lot of her young life um, and is about to leave us for a while. Um, the subtitle of this episode of Talk of the Town is Gayatri Sundarajan from Arlington, or Arlington to Oxford, because... Uh, her journey in many ways began in Arlington or in this area, uh, and the next step on it is Oxford University. Yes, that Oxford. So, first of all, Gayatri, hey. <laughs> Hi, James. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you and I have talked about having this conversation uh, for a long time, so I'm really glad that we're here. Absolutely. Um, and I did just mention that you're soon off to Oxford, so we should be clear or we should let people know what we're talking about. You are about to start a PhD program at Oxford. Um, I'm curious, I know, I happen to know, that you had a number of choices. Um, just uh, You just, re just graduated this past May from BU School of Engineering. We'll talk about that as well. Um, but uh, you had a bunch of choices, including standard American programs. You're going to Oxford. How come? Yeah. So the University of Oxford is really exciting because of the engineering as well as the people. And so that's really what made the decision for me. Um, I knew that I wanted to study a PhD. There it's called the DPhil, essentially the same program. Um, and I knew that what I wanted to do was create new knowledge in the space of water desalination and specifically water production for low resource communities. But what I saw in traditional PhD programs is there's a lot of isolation, specifically in that time where you're delving into a topic. Mm -hmm. But what I found at Oxford, which was really interesting, is based on the community as well as the environment that's constructed, people are just as important as the actual technology and the information that you're learning. And so I really kind of chose Oxford because of that community and because of the environment that I think I'll be a part of. I haven't visited yet, so that's kind of going to be the big um, reveal, I guess, once I go there. Mm -hmm. Right. You're already, I mean, you're, 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 your foot is already firmly planted there, but you have not actually seen the place yes. yet. Fortunately, yeah. I think you won't be disappointed, probably. But I am interested a little bit to, 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 to ask you a little bit more about what are the pedagogical differences between, um, you know, the way that you are going to uh, learn what you learn and do what you do at Oxford versus uh, what people would do in a, in a, like I said, a more standard American PhD program? So I guess the biggest difference between the two programs in structure is that the Oxford program is three and a half years. And so essentially you go in and completely just do research. And so I'd be going in, and that first year I'd have to understand what the problem is and propose essentially what I would be doing as my thesis at the end of that three and a half year. Um, and I would be essentially having an exam, an oral examination at the end of each year to make sure that I'm meeting these milestones and that I'm publishing papers as that's going on. In the US system, you traditionally have about two years if you're going from a bachelor's, as I am, to essentially do courses, which is equivalent to a master's, and then you'd go into your research. So the structure of the course is a little bit different. I'm able to finish it a little bit earlier. But in terms of the pedagogy, I guess the reason for that is that in, at the DPhil stage in, um, in Oxford, I can't speak for all UK universities, um, the idea is that you're learning independently. And that is kind of the hallmark of a PhD. The idea is that you're able to create new knowledge. You're able to take all of those steps to say, is this reasonable? Is this the next step I should be taking? What is really the gap? And it's less of um, the professor kind of telling you, here's a project, and, and guiding you every step of the way. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be a lot of frustration and challenge in terms of figuring out what the real problem is. But I think what's really satisfying is that you really have to struggle and, frust and be frustrated to understand what is the right next step. And you have to convince yourself that you should be doing that. And that's skills that are going to be useful much longer than the PhD itself. Um, yeah, and really that plays right in, the, you know, that's right in your wheelhouse, Gayatri, from our experience with you here at ACMI, by which I mean 
what you're doing is putting yourself in a program, as you said, you're more or less skipping the master's part of what would uh, be a traditional PhD approach here in the US, where you're taking courses, you're learning, again, in, in the way that you were just describing. Professors are explaining things to you and you are using them and other resources to better understand stuff. Sounds like here, you both have to have a clearer formulation from the beginning of what your goal is and what projects you want to work on or what goals, uh, you know, what the things are that you want to achieve. And then you got to figure out how to do it more or less yourself, is that right? So that's essentially what it is. You still have an advisor in the same way that you would here, but the sense is that everybody is doing their independent projects that are less connected to a specific lab and their own focus. Mm -hmm. um, and this might be the case specifically with my lab versus all of the labs that are available. Because in a PhD, still in the UK and the US, you find that it's very lab and department specific. Um, yeah, so I think that what's really important to consider is that U.S. universities do have kind of the benefit in the sense that when you have a PhD in that field, you really are an expert in that department. So for me, if I did a PhD here, I would be an expert in mechanical engineering. I would have to get some sort of expertise and knowledge in several key mechanical engineering areas. In Oxford, the, the worry is that I could go down the path and only be a specialist in water desalination for low resource communities. So what that takes is it's using the resources and the people that I've met um, through engineering at BU as well as at who I will meet at Oxford and get a sense of what are the broader areas that I wanna have exposure to, to make sure that I'm not getting limited in the PhD process and I'm still aware of kind of new things that are coming about and still aware of kind of you know, new ideas as well as techniques that are being used. So I love the idea there that you, uh, you know, that the danger is that you go down too far down a rabbit hole and that you have to rely instead on your, on who you are and the way that you know that you are uh, in order to make sure that doesn't happen and you're in fact learning from others, interacting with others, figuring out again how to expand what you're learning when the danger would be that, you know, a contraction in that. So. Let's talk about that a little bit more because that's also refracted back. I'd, I'd like to now go a kind of reverse chronology, right? We've just talked to you about where you're headed um, and you know, very good luck to you. Part of this is really a, a, a celebration of this accomplishment um, as well as an exploration of what, of what led to it. Um, but we really want to talk about you as the kind of learner that you are in a lot of ways. And we saw that happen, as I said, at ACMI. So let's talk about ACMI and your time in Arlington, which you spent grade school, middle school, high school. Um, um, let's start with ACMI. Um, when did you start at ACMI and how? Yeah, so I started in ACMI when I was in sixth grade, so I think I was about 11. Um, I actually just came in by chance as an after-school program um, from the Audison Middle School. And essentially, I was here about one day a week for a game show. At the same time, there was this National History Day competition, and I decided, OK, I'm in this TV studio. Let me learn a little bit more. And so I decided to create a documentary for that. <laughs> and so that was really like where I dived in. I was taking out cameras that were like larger than I was and carrying that. And I remember at the time, we had actual like film that we had to like put through a reel in order to like get the video onto a computer. And so I started at that point. And then from there, I was just, I guess, kind of hooked to it. There's something about just coming here and being able to make anything that was super empowering. But also I had people here who were encouraging me throughout the way when I didn't know something, when I um, wanted to learn a little bit more about what somebody else was doing. Both staff as well as volunteers from, you know, even at that point, were super excited to talk about it. So I would always spend maybe double the amount of time that I had expected mm -hmm. um, in the studio. Well, I remember you know meeting you first here at ACMI when a couple of years in, I guess, a, a couple of years after that, maybe you, you might have been 12 or 13 at that point. Um, and already you were um, kind of on the road towards becoming this prolific, truly prolific producer here at ACMI, such that you actually won an ACMI award for prolific producer, meaning, man, you just created a whole bunch of content over time. Interestingly, as I observed, you were doing that in conjunction with and often supervising uh, and organizing for sure the adults around you. Every once in a while, the staff, but certainly uh, other members and volunteers, et cetera, uh, where you really were the producer 
um, from an early age. I'm curious, uh, do you do you remember how it was how how that was to you know be again supervising, motivating, uh, helping, educate in a lot of ways people who were twice as old as you, three times as old as you. How, how it was did did that feel strange to you? Was it a natural thing? It's funny because it was almost natural, not in the way that I was just always talking to adults. I think for me it was we were all working on a production together. And if I had something that I thought I could do, I wanted to do that. And if there's something that needed to be organized, I was like, let me do that. And whoever my team was, it didn't really matter. Like I was one part of a team, I was leading a team. It was just, I wanted to be as useful as possible. And I think a part of that was I was held to the same standard as everybody else. It wasn't like, oh, here's this 12 year old, like let's let her do one thing. It was like, okay, whatever you can do, you can do that and we'll teach you anything you want to learn. So I was really just like around. And I think shadowing people, talking to them, sitting in on productions, hearing things. And so I almost naturally absorbed it. And because I was here, I actually had a lot of experience just by like, by the nature of what I had learned along the way, but also just by diving in and just saying, OK, I don't understand this thing, but I need it for something else. So let me figure out how to do that. I think a lot of the time, it's it was just taking the time to really dive deeper into whether it was editing a certain effect, figuring out how to use a camera. Like I remember at the beginning, I didn't know how to use any of the cameras. So I read the entire manual. <laughs> and I like I, it was Walter who I was checking it out from at the time. And I was like, I don't know how to use this camera. I'll bring it back to you. I read the manual. Like I don't know what else I can tell you. <laughs> and he was like, OK. That's good enough. Yeah, it's good enough, I guess. <laughs> well, obviously, it was good enough in the end. Um, so that, that idea, I, I, I really feel like you've just kind of uh, distilled in some ways the essence of working with you right down to the nub there in saying that hey there was a there was a message that you got that was hey if you you can do it go ahead and do it or if you can if you if you can figure out what it is that you need to know uh, either learn it yourself or we're here to help um, but that you really thrived in kind of a situation where Basically, your naturally expansive curiosity and your desire to get something done and your willingness to not be intimidated by what it would take to get something done, all these things kind of came together for you to just be, be able to do this in what sounds like was a natural way. I mean, I would say that one thing I loved about it was that it was just natural autonomy. Like, I never felt like I was getting like somebody was pulling rank on me and I felt like I was doing it out of my own agency, but I was also saying that I wanna do this as well as I can. And I definitely don't know how to do it as well as some people here, so let me just learn from everybody possible. Um, and I think being held to such a high standard I think was really key. I was working with Sarah for such a long time. This from is the Sarah, Sarah Alfaro Alfaro Franco, Franco our, our, ex, our former colleague who handled the news and public affairs, et cetera, and big influence for you. I Absolutely. And I remember the first production I did with her. I edited that for one month, like every single day. I mean, about two times a week, I'd go in for like four hours, edit it, and then she would write down feedback on time code, specifically being like, oh, what did you think about this? Like, I think you should change that. And we went back and forth for a month. And that's the time that I finally got to release my first piece. And her whole thing was consistency as well as quality. And so every single week, I'd produce one or two segments. And that's just how I got better. But also, that was how I constantly got feedback. I think it was the sense of I had the, the benefit of being super naive. Like, I wasn't able to say, OK, this is my perception of myself as 13. This is what I should be able to do. I was like, well, I'm here. Everybody else is doing this. Nobody, like, nobody said explicitly that I can't. So why not try? Mm -hmm. And so I think that just pushed me forward. And I had no reason to doubt that I could do it. It's just some things took longer than others. And some things were quicker for me than other things were. But it was all just part of that same learning process. Yeah, and it sounds like it was a really lovely marriage of you being a person who, like you said, was not, like you just didn't think about what you couldn't do. You just tried to figure out how you could do um, whatever it was. And an environment here, a, 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 an atmosphere that, like you said, non-hierarchical, you know, just because you're 13 or 15 or whatever it was you were, doesn't mean that you can't head this crew and have that idea and master that technology, et cetera, et cetera. And so that combination really produced actually quite a, quite a bit of magic um, during your time here. 
But I also think that, that that's probably, that's a you that you carry into a lot of different contexts, right? So there were other things in our other places you were spending time in Arlington while you were here, mostly school, I think. Uh, but I know you made good use of the library, et cetera. So what, you know, what, as you look back on your years here spent in Arlington, what, what do you see as the impact of being in this particular community on, you know, you developing this, <laughs> Uh, this just all-encompassing uh, both curiosity and ability to, to act on that curiosity. I guess I can go backward a little bit through each of the main levels of education because I think that might be the clearest way to do it. Mm -hmm. So in high school, I was just a part of a lot of different groups. Like I was a part of speech and debate, mock trial, chorus, like all of these different groups where I was either one among many or I was leading the team. So on mock trial, it was a lot of figuring out how to dive into details and then putting that together in a case and presenting it. So it was a lot of the same skills that I actually gained here. The sense of how do you learn something really quickly? How do you make sure that you can actually communicate your case and actually get up there and do that effectively and co cohesively um, and with the, the right words for the situation? And so that's something that I realized when I went into engineering later on, that not everybody has that same ability. Mm -hmm. um, even though I didn't have, let's say, the technical background based on the clubs that I had access to here at Arlington High School, I did actually get something else that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. It was just this like, willingness and ability to communicate, and it was an ability to get the feedback early on in many different capacities. In speech and debate, I did an event called impromptu speaking, where we had essentially three minutes to give a speech that you would have one minute to prep based on just like three different words. Um, and so it was just practicing over and over in settings where whether I failed or I succeeded didn't really matter. It was just an opportunity to improve. And then in middle school, I was a part of some similar other groups. Um, one of them was Generation Citizen, where you learned about different kinds of ethics and worked on a project related to the community. It was all about kind of like, how do you plug yourself in among many other people and communicate your ideas? And so I think it's always been a question for me of how do I kind of take something that I'm curious about, dive a little bit deeper, and present it. Um, what I do right now in mechanical engineering is a little bit different. But I think at the core of it, it's the same kind of set of skills. Mm -hmm. And I think that Arlington's really exciting because of the people that you're surrounded by. Um, I've just found that even when we lived in Arlington, we would walk around the neighborhood and we'd just get into conversations with people. There's somebody building a plane in their garage. There's somebody else who is a teacher here. We, like It was just really exciting to talk to people. And I think being in that community really did help kind of say that there was no bounds on things I could do. Just because I saw people doing you know, an assortment of things that they were genuinely passionate about. So it was a question for me of finding what that thing was or what that... Um, area was that I wanted to kind of dive deeper into. So let me ask you as the last, maybe the last question in this kind of part of this part of our conversation. Um, as again, you're still young, of course, but you do have some years of education and um, both kind of like autodidactic education, the education you gave yourself and the education you received through our institutions. Um, and as you look back on that, how do, how, do you, how do you see that balance between the stuff that you learned from being in classes and doing the reading and, and interacting with others around projects and stuff like that, and the stuff that you learned outside of those contexts in the extracurriculars that you did in the various groups that you were involved in here at ACMI, in the other, again, out of school, out of academic spaces? How do you see that, th that balance you know, working for you? Was one or the other a more powerful influence? Or just talk about that a little bit. That's a really interesting question. I, I think that in school, it's interesting because I spend a lot of time listening to other people, spend a lot of time reading, and then for assignments, kind of not regurgitating it, but you think a little bit and you have to kind of produce something. Um, and it's not necessarily what you want to focus on. It's very much tailored to what the assignment is asking from you. And so I think that through that way, I was able to just learn a lot of different topics. Like I was really excited about like middle school and high school because you just learned so much. You had about five different subjects a day that were going from history all the way to like math. And I just loved that. It's very different than in college, at least for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just loved the exposure to different topics. But in one way or another, there's a set curriculum and you're following it and you're meeting other people's expectations. There's something you need to do for an assignment. There's something that um, guarantees that you get like an A or a B. There's something that says that you haven't met 
um, what is expected of you. But in all of these things that are outside of school, there's a question of why are you doing this? What is it that you really want from it? And how do you shape that to really make that the best experience for you? And I think that gave me, in addition to just kind of an outlet for just saying, OK, I'm interested, about, interested in this thing. Let me dive in. Just an opportunity to define what it is that I wanted to output from it. At ACMI, that was videos in uh, Boston University that was like rockets or other things. So it was just saying that the, the output outcome is very different, but you can negotiate what it looks like. And it's something that is you know, good for the organization that you're working with or for. But it's also satisfying for you, which is why for me, why I chose to go down one route or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and obviously you have absolute ownership over whatever it is that happens in those spheres um, because obviously you're going along, going with the flow uh, in your, your, high, your middle school, your high school, even to some degree college curricula. Uh, and, you know, somebody else is determining something about what it is that's important for you to know. Um, but then there are these other spaces where you define all of that. And uh, it does seem like you, you know, that's a particular power spot for you. I definitely love it. And I think that it also has just given me the practical side. Because I think that you can spend a lot of time just reading and consuming information in classes. But you may not actually produce something that you can look at and that has, you know, brings you some sort of contentment. I think the first time that I did that in schooling might have been building like a catapult in physics. I was like, oh my gosh, I can actually do this. And I felt a lot more of that in engineering when I was uh, studying at Boston University. And I also felt that in internships later on when I could say, OK, I'd learned this thing. But now the actual mechanics of putting it together and building it is very different. And you learn a lot in the process of it not working and troubleshooting that. And I think a lot of people can relate to that regardless of what field they're in. Mm -hmm. The theory of doing something is very different than doing it in practice. And I find that I love the troubleshooting of actually making that into a reality. I remember you doing an awful lot of that here at ACMI over the years, that's for sure. All right, you know, I know that the roots of everything that we've been talking about go back even further. And so we're going to continue this reverse chronology, if you don't mind. We're going to take a break, though, first, and then welcome a guest uh, to join us who will be able to provide his own insight into uh, Gayatri's earlier years. So stay with us. We'll take a short break, and we'll be right back. This is Talk of the Town and Gayatri Sundarajan from Arlington to Oxford. here uh, and be able to speak with our fire chief, Kevin Kelly. So first of all, I want to welcome you very much. Thank um, you and welcome here. And thank you for welcoming us here. Mm -hmm. It's been several years since we were last here and uh, the place still looks sparkling clean mm -hmm. and impressive. Well, it's nice. That's dangerous. That's dangerous and it's in. Unbelievable. Team Kanyan out of, out of nothing. Unbelievable. Welcome back. Um, we are joined for this next part of the conversation by mm, somebody who knows a little bit about Gayatri himself. Uh, Sundar Rajan Ramaswamy is here with us. He is Gayatri's father. Sundar, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation, James. Very, really appreciate it. very important that you be here in a lot of ways because we want to 
um, explore again, as I mentioned before, a little bit even further back from what Gayatri just took us through uh, middle school and high school, et cetera. Let's go back a little further. And, and I'd like for either of you, um, and, and feel free to, you know, talk to each other and talk <laughs> through each other, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Just to describe the, you know, describe the household that uh, Gayatri was born into and has grown up within. I think I'll I'll put it this way: when we walk, when we came to this country, Gayatri was uh, one year old in uh, the year 2000, around December of 2000, and uh, we at that point in time did not know what it means to bring up a family in United States. Practically, no. I mean, I had a two and a half year old and a one year old. And uh, my wife had never traveled outside of the United States, never traveled outside of the state even, the state that we both got married in, in, in back in India. So when we walked in, we said, hmm, how are we going to do this? Are we going to even stay here in this country forever? Or are we going to go back to India and then grow the entire family back in India? We didn't know at that point in time. So there was significant amount of uncertainty. But one thing we knew was that no matter what we do, we will invest in our kids. That is something that I think both my wife and I, we committed to that, saying that no matter what happens, we will make sure that they get a, a good, solid family life, which means that we will not um, have any difference of opinion openly in front of the kids. Simply not. And we will not use any of the cuss words, swear words, nothing in front of them. Much, much later, they started hearing it, but when they were growing up, they did not know any of those things. If there was any layer of uh, misunderstanding, we will deal with it privately and never in front of the kids. So they had, I would call it as a normal period, but at the same time, it was something where they knew what it means to be peaceful. And that, I think, played a significant role in how they both developed in their own way, both uh, J, uh, Gayatri and her elder sister Jay, they both developed over a period of time. That layer of peace was hidden somewhere. Mm -hmm. All it means is that over a period of time, we'll need to kind of find our way to it, but it was always there. And that is one thing which I feel uh, fortunate that, that we were able to do it. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, you didn't, you didn't know whether you would, you know, how long you would stay here. You didn't know exactly how it would be to raise children here. As it turned out, you did. You raised mm -hmm. both Jay and Gayatri here. Um, what did you find in in terms of, you know, living this kind of bicultural life? And this I throw out, out mm -hmm. to both of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what are some of the things that for somebody who's trying to, doesn't, this hasn't been their experience, but they're trying to understand it. What, what kind of light can you shed on what's particular about, you know, your guys' experience at least? Yeah, why don't, start Gaitri, why don't you start it off? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think what's interesting is that there's always, there's more people. <laughs> so I think that's the beginning part. Like I grew up for most of my childhood in a multi-generational family. So I had my dad's parents also living with us, my grandparents. And so I had in- And they still are, right? And they still are, yeah. They live with us right now and it's great. Um, but basically it's kind of two sets of parents who come from very different upbringings themselves and then my sister and I in the household for a given amount of time. So that means essentially like you have even more kind of love and caring around you at all times. And sometimes that can be like really smothering and overprotective. <laughs> like there's definitely that side of it. But then I always grew up knowing that I was cared for and that like I could do literally anything and I knew I would have them like kind of in my corner. I think the other side of it is that negotiation was just something that is natural. It's the only way you get anything. When you have to get a clear from four different people and also have to like somehow be okay with your older sister, right? Like that means everything you do has to somehow be able to be explained and have to be something that you generally like really want to do to get it through all of these hoops. But you also need to think about how you're going to make that happen. Like if I was going to go somewhere, I have to keep in mind that my grandmother comes from a time when women didn't leave the house alone because it was unsafe. Or like, you know, for her, me crossing the street at any given time is still something she worries about. Mm -hmm. And so I have to keep in mind kind of what culture she came from. And with my mom, she has a certain thing that she's aware of and she's comfortable with. My dad and my grandfather are, you know, had their own things as well. So I had to keep in mind 
all of these things every time I wanted to do something. So I always, when I grew up, would have to explain things. And would have to say, OK, this is what I want to do and why. Like even if it's a basic thing that I wanted to buy or something that I wanted to like go out and try, mm -hmm. and so it just became a natural thing to kind of go through all that, uh, I guess, rationalization. Mm -hmm. And there was even points where I like learned research that way. Like my dad made me like make a spreadsheet every time I wanted an, a pet. <laughs> so I had this like lifetime of a dog spreadsheet because we really <laughs> desperately wanted a dog. So we had to think about what was it going to eat, where was it going to live, what would like who would take care of it, what does that mean for time, like where are we going to get the food, what kind of food, how does that change over time, medical insurance. And this was like us at 10 being like, please, can we? And then, you know, think about that and we ended up with like a Nintendo game. Right? <laughs> Right? So like that is just the natural way that my family has worked. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just the communication you need among six people. And the other piece is just like my family just really cares about thinking about things mm -hmm. and really answering the question of why. And sometimes it's like debates that lead nowhere. And sometimes it's things that mean like let's really deeply think about something that you want mm -hmm. and really understand why that is. And it sure gave you plenty of practice in terms of, like you said, Organizing, negotiating, and persuading adults—you uh, know—that <laughs> your that your point of view, your idea, your your desire was you know w was based on something uh, legitimate enough to convince them. That's that's uh, that is quite amazing. So for you, Sundar, as 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 a person, you know, as one of the four kind of parental figures that needed to be negotiated with, but also again as the, as the father and the son. Uh, at the same time, how, how you know what kind of experience was that for you? I think it, that's a that's a very interesting question, James. I'll kind of flip it a little bit, right? They have to get used to me. I have to get used to them because I've not lived with a very young kids at all, right? I mean, when when I was growing up, we three brothers were one and a half years apart. Okay, right? I mean. And we never had um, uh, girl children in our family. Her elder sister was the first first generation grandkid, right? And so we were getting used to what it means to actually make uh, a child grow. We were learning as much as they were getting used to us. So which means good amount of our experiments in parenting, guess who was the target? They were the target. Right? So we were learning how to be a good parent through them. Right? And so one of the things that we decided, I don't know whether it's good, bad, or ugly, is that we said we will invest in them being what is called both Indian and American at the same time, no matter where it goes. Right? Which means that there is a layer of Indianness in, in how they look at things. But there is a very distinctly American way of doing things, which is a layer of argumentation. There is a layer of irreverence. There is a layer of uh, negotiation, persuasion, every other thing that an individual, a person has to do in order to make something happen, they have that in, in good measure. So we said bicultural is going to be the norm, but we don't know what bicultural means because... But how does that work given that you know, you're not the only one making the decision, right? I'm almost yes, so there then too. what we said was there are certain things that we will let, we will discuss with our parents to just make sure that they are in the loop, but the veto was something that we were carefully negotiating to say certain things the veto doesn't rest with my parents. So which means that we had to talk it through and make sure that they are comfortable because their primary concern is being girl children in a country that we don't know much about, seeing all the news that we see, how safety of the kids and safety of young women is in jeopardy in various news that they mm -hmm. see. We had to make sure that they will be physically safe and psychologically safe. If that can be guaranteed, then the decision about what they do is something that can be autonomous. Mm -hmm. So every step of the way, we negotiated that distinctly with my parents. And that helped us in a variety of ways, but in certain cases, it related to challenges. And that's 
that's to be expected. Mm -hmm. So right? I guess in many ways it was a negotiation for them. It is a negotiation for as them. As much right. as it is for us. Right. Because there's some things when, like, I was going to be living in an apartment, even though I, you know, lived 30 minutes from home in going to college. That was a negotiation that my parents had to have with my grandparents. With, right. Because it's a choice that is ultimately mine, and it should be mine. But at the end of the day, living in a multi-generational household and re uh, respecting everybody in the family means that you want to explain it to everybody in a way that resonates with them and makes sense and doesn't make anybody feel like they're less important. Because that's really hard, like, becoming elderly in any society. And when you're in a family and you feel like you're becoming less and less relevant or you feel like you're not part of the decisions, like, that is a feeling of, you know, a loss of importance that we don't want my grandparents to have. Yeah. But it's hard because that's balanced off with the autonomy that my sister and I want and that my parents want to have in how they make decisions. So mm -hmm. I think it's all a negotiation. But at the end of the day, there are decisions that each one of us is going to make that not everybody agrees with. And I think doing that in a way that's respectful but also is just firm enough, I think, is, is the key. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And we kind of managed to strike some level of balance in that so that decisions that get made even though they are autonomous, they have the broadest layer of support so that things can move forward in a, in a how do you call it? I mean, Gayatri put it very well, respectful way. Because you're, you're absolutely true that their life experience, my life experience, Gayatri and Jay's life experience, they are all very, very distinct. And her life experience has been the most diverse among, among, among both my two kids, right? And so, the way they will look at things may not be identical. But at the same time, if we cannot talk about our difference of opinion in a respectful way, there's no fun. Yeah. Right? I should say Ranjani has had her diverse life experience. Exactly. They're yeah. just very different than They're mine. very different than right. us. I mean, yeah. they referring both, to Jay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, to Jay and yeah. uh, her, they both have had fairly very, very diverse experiences. Uh, but but um, they both grew very differently from the same household, to be mm -hmm. brutally honest mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. So, but that's that's the fun part of being a parent, you know. Right? Absolutely. Well, I think you guys have done a great job in, in a relatively short amount of time of of, of describing both the uh, you know the opportunities and the and the growth that can happen within these constraints, but also the challenges of just negotiating, like you said, between cultures represented differently from your, in your grandparents' generation and your generation kind of caught in between in a sense, and in yours really growing up in this country, even within a, a, a household where uh, the Indian her heritage in that household highly respected and, and, uh, and with a, a clear impact. Um, but just that and then the multi-generational part too. So really lots and lots of lessons learned more or less by osmosis for you, I guess, simply by, you know, living in that household and, and, and growing up as a child in that household and wanting to get some certain things, pets or otherwise, uh, at different times. Um, let me ask you, Sundar, if you don't mind, um, just uh, two more things I want to ask you guys. One is, what were the challenges of bringing this one up? I mean, I don't, you know, I think people might have the impression, ah, oh, she just, she's, Perfectly God, great, she's, right? she's God's gift and, you know, she <laughs> sails right through everything. Tell us what, what some of the hard parts were. Uh, I would say one of the things that um, is, is um, remarkable about her, but also at the same time a little bit challenging, is that um, she is high intensity which means that making her chill and take anything, saying that, okay, there are some times you have to let life happen, and it happens the way it happens. You can't script everything. I mean, you cannot show that high intensity everywhere. And that is a constant struggle, okay? Right? Sometimes it, it, it kind of goes in one way, but then there are times where it becomes a headbutting moment, okay? I mean, for instance, we were coming down from there to, from our home to here. We were delayed by 10 minutes. She would absolutely go berserk, saying that we should not have been delayed. I said, it is what it is. 
Mm-hmm. They're going to be 10 minutes delayed. It is what it is. And but they're going to forgive us, guys. They are going they're to forgive gonna be us. Okay. They are going to I be will say, okay about it. I add a little you bit know? of color to that. I think the thing is that most things are preventable. And when you've made the measures <laughs> to prevent them, yeah. they don't need them so to happen. The point is so that... It, <laughs> it's a little bit of a balance. The point is it's preventable until it is not. <laughs> it happened. There's no right. way when, that Once it's done, right. Once, once it has, hap- has happened, has happened, then happen, you need to accept Then you have to just things. accept and say, <laughs> how am I going to live with it and, and move on, yeah. right? So we would have a, a, that kind of intensity is something which I love about Gayatri, but at the same time I say, you have to chill down. Okay, I mean, that's one, one category of things. I think the second, ca- the list? There's, there's a second <laughs> category is is how do you cherish time, right? I mean, you can cherish time just saying that there is time in front of me. I am either doing something or I am not doing something or I am thinking about something. And I'm not going to do anything at all. I'm going to keep this time totally unscripted, right? Gayatri and unscripted, they both don't fit in the same sentence. You know, I mean, it simply doesn't fit. I mean, she has to have structure all the way through. I say structure is good until structure becomes your own enemy. It just makes you not enjoy the moment as much as you would because that structure will say what's coming next. It makes you anticipate, it makes you mm-hmm. expect it. And then if that expectation is not met, then it results in a frustration. If that frustration leads to a little bit more, then it becomes a big negative vortex. And I always say, chill, <laughs> right? Okay, right. I mean, that's, that's I, I would say, the second category of things, okay? I mean, those are the two two things that kind of uh, are, are uh, pretty, pretty exciting kind of challenges to kind of, uh, Discuss with Gayatri, right? Occasionally, right? And and we do talk about it on a on a, on a very regular basis. I think the mm-hmm. unscripted one has come up a lot. Okay. Yeah. I think it's just right. the idea that you know the way that everybody wants to spend their time is different. And so my dad's perspective of spending time is different than my perspective. And so this is an ongoing, I think, debate, debate back and forth. I think we can tell that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can tell kind of the points back and forth. Yeah, on that. no, but there's and and it, it makes a lot of sense. And actually, it, it segues very nicely into the last thing that I wanted to ask you about or talk to you about, and that is, uh, and, and here I need to do some full disclosure. I am a former teacher myself and a college advisor for a number of years, and because I've known Gayatri for a good long while as well, um, I also had a kind of a role of that sort as she was looking at colleges some years ago. Uh, you might very well be able to tell what I think of Gayatri and, um, and why, um, and so I figured she was going to sail absolutely sail through the application process. So no, I said that to Sundar, uh, I said that to Gayatri. I uh, told her to chill uh, in my own way, uh, in a lot of ways, and to apply to the most prestigious and selective schools because that's where she belonged in a lot of ways for the opportunities that they offered, et cetera. So then the results came in. And uh, just, again, I think this is an object lesson. Gayatri has enormous talents and is no doubt going to be changing the world in her way. Um, And yet, it has not been smooth sailing all along. Those results came in, and it was rejection after rejection after rejection. Um, Talk to us about that. In the end, really, you went to BU School of Engineering because that was the place that accepted you. Right? So yeah. I'm really interested to hear, again, with some years of removed from that and with the great outcome that we celebrated at the top of this, what was that like for both of you? For you as a parent, Sundar, in that situation, knowing how special your daughter is? And for you, you know, who, you know, had been reassured assured, and had an expectation, perhaps. I don't know. Talk to us a little bit. I can start off on that. You want to start off yeah. on that? I mean, Go if you it. want to. Uh, why don't I start off on this one? Go for right, it. Right? I think, James, uh, you, you, you said it really well, which is that it was probably the most, um, how do you call it, uh, disappointing would be an understatement. I think we were um, uh, pretty much blown away when we looked at how pretty much all of the schools that we thought we had a fair shake at it, they said, nope. 
we are not willing to offer uh, either an early admission or a regular admission. Some of them they put us on uh, a, wait uh, a, a wait list, right? But at the end of the day, we, we one of the things we realized is that it is almost a jackpot or a, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a game, right? Sometimes the people who got accepted and who were left out, right? The gap could be pretty minimal. But then we kind of reflected on that and we said, we got into a good school and the experience of what it means to graduate from there is completely up to you. And therefore, it's not that failures don't occur. It is what you do and what you pick up from that failure and you grow from there determines who you are. And I'll tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very proud of how Gayatri handled that rejection at such an young age when the hopes were built up to be this high and then she came crashing down that only one out of the schools that she applied gave her admission and that school turned out to be the one that shaped her into who she is today. So I would say, uh, don't be afraid of failures. Make something good come out of it. Okay, that's that's exactly where, how I would I would frame it, uh, James. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because I would say it was definitely disappointing in the moment. Like, essentially, the way that the applications come in or they did at the time was that you would essentially have different dates that you're expected to hear back, and so every week it's basically getting a no or getting yeah, essentially. And so you've spent months doing applications, and you get months of basically people saying, yeah, you're you're good like everybody else, but you're not good enough. Um, so that was definitely disappointing. It was definitely upsetting. But I think the the key there was that there are a ton of really great students out there. There's a, there's a lot of really great people. All of these schools can fill their classes with, you know, five different variations of a cohort, and they'll have a great class. And so when I look at it, it's not to say that I'm better than everybody else and I should have gotten in. It's to say that there are a ton of really great students, and I'm one of them, but I didn't get into those schools. And... So yes, it's disappointing in the moment, but it's to say that it was just one thing that happened. And it's very hard to evaluate people on paper. Like I think that I remember when I was writing my applications, something that I was really struggling with was how do I stay really true to how I felt about each of the questions that they were asking and who I felt I was at that time? And how do I really market that, market myself to a school given that they have to accept you for that application? And the route that I chose was let me be as um, myself as possible. Let me just put exactly what I think on the page. It doesn't really matter what they expect from me. And at the end of the day, I think that's something I learned a lot from the experience. It's not to say that you shouldn't be original or as creative as you can be, but it's very important to say that you need to understand the, the environment and the situation that you're in. In a college application process, it, you are required to market yourself to the college, knowing that everybody is looking for certain things. Even if somebody says they're unbiased, at the end of the day, there are certain buzzwords, there are certain parts of your experiences that really resonate with them, because you're connecting on a human level. And there's some experiences I have that just don't resonate, or there's ways that I can say that that do. So it just became an effort for me of saying that in the future, Yes, I can hear from other people that, yes, I'm special. I have these things that I've done that I think are really unique. But if I can't communicate that, or if I can't put that into a package that makes sense or really will resonate with the people that are receiving it, it doesn't have that same power. And so it was disappointing. But then once I decided to go to BU, I wanted to say, OK, this is the choice that I'm making. But I can essentially make of it um, whatever it is that I want. There are all of these resources available at all of these schools. There's, uh, for me, when I was going to engineering, there's maker spaces, there's labs, there's research, there's essentially the same coursework. It becomes an effort of saying, how are you going to use those resources to get where you want to go? And that's an individualized path. And you can do that regardless of what school you're in. I think that at the age of like 17 or 18, when you're looking at colleges, it seems like the biggest decision you're going to make, you choose that college, and then you're kind of done. But I think. Like any milestone, it's a starting point. It's something that sets the opportunities you have in front of you, but you can always reach out beyond that to then secure what you want to do. So it became almost the best timing for a lesson on just being independent and saying that, setting, setting, saying that I can set my own goals and figuring out how to get there. And 
that gave me the, the good understanding of the risk involved with you know, applying to a certain set of schools in that case, or you know, it could be a, applying to a certain set of jobs. You might think that you're perfect, you might think that you have all the skill set, but you have that final step of fitting with the people there, the community, as well as the people who are hiring you. So it becomes an effort for me of like applying to different kinds of jobs, of speaking to people before them, seeing if I have the right skill set, how I can improve. It became kind of this good opportunity for me to reevaluate how I then present myself um, and then figure out how do I go out and look for opportunities in the future. So it was really devastating at the time, but I think that you know, learning that kind of lesson at 18 is better than learning it at 30. So much, much later. I was able to, to kind of pick that up from that moment and then put that into my applications and my time at BU and then what I'm doing uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is one of the things which is truly remarkable about how Gayatri f processed that event at that young age, which is you could say that all the schools except BU rejected me. Right? Or she could say, BU accepted me, let me get the best experience out of it and learn all of the things that can make my experience here shine and make me into, uh, make me into somebody. You know, right? I have an opportunity here, let me go and grab it. And, and that maturity is something which I'm, I'm really very, very proud of how she processed it. And because I was president at the time, I can, I can corroborate that that was indeed the case. And I was flabbergasted that it could be, given how it had, <laughs> the whole thing affected me. Uh, you know, so really, um, couldn't be better said. Thank you both so much for addressing that and, and, and really kind of talking through it in a, in, a, in a very real but also inspiring way. Um, and in the end, uh, it was a different uh, experience with graduate programs and you had a number to choose from and uh, in the end I would say as I'm sure you would agree and maybe you would as well Oxford got lucky <laughs> um, so we look forward so much to continuing to chart your progress even as you move across the ocean um, we know that you'll stay in touch we know that we'll even get you back into the studio sometime of course. in the next in the next uh, few years and um, we, um, we fully expect, like I said, that uh, you are going to continue to do just what you've done so far, which is figure out what you want to learn, learn it really well, turn it into practice, and make a difference. So um, with that, I want to thank you both so much for joining us for this very special talk of the town. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks, James. Thank you very much, James, for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. Um, I will wrap, we will wrap up there. Uh, it's really been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, this has been a special episode of Talk of the Town featuring Gayatri Sundarajan and her route from Arlington to Oxford. Uh, we will catch up with her later and you as well. Thanks so much for joining us. James Milan, see you next time.